proceed? Hank, I'm ready when you are. Okay, all right, thank you. We'll, we'll call a hearing back into order and uh, grant our, uh, or, or give you our uh, appreciation for your time. And uh, thank you for your uh, statement, uh, Mr. Askew, and now we'll turn it over to Ms. Gardner. Ms. Garza, I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Coble, and when they get here, if they do, other distinguished members of the House uh, Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Course and Competition Policy. It is a privilege to be invited to speak today about the role of antitrust enforcement in the current financial crisis. I am not appearing today on behalf of any organization. I do not purport to express the views of either the Antitrust Modernization Commission or the Justice Department. However, my written statement uh, does discuss several uh, relevant recommendations of the AMC. In addition to discussing those recommendations, my written testimony makes a few points in response to the subcommittee's specific question about what role antitrust should play in bank mergers today, particularly those funded by the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, and whether the antitrust law should be used to block mergers on the basis that the resulting financial firms that might subsequently, might subsequently be deemed too big to fail. Uh, to briefly summarize, uh, first, antitrust enforcement and sound competition policy remain relevant in the current financial crisis. Competitively operating financial markets drive economic growth and ensure that consumers benefit from, from lower prices, higher quality, innovation, and diversity of products. Although we urgently need to strengthen and protect the banking system in order to prevent further deterioration of the economy, we must also be mindful uh, of the longer term competitive effects of consolidation. Second, there is no apparent necessary conflict between current antitrust enforcement policy and achieving stability in banking markets. The Justice Department's antitrust division should continue to assess the likely competitive effects of mergers, including those funded through TARP or involving banks in which the U.S. government has taken an equity interest. Third, there is no evidence that the current economic crisis resulted from a failure of antitrust merger enforcement in the banking industry or that current merger law needs to be changed to address bank mergers. Fourth, antitrust enforcement, enforcement should continue to focus on whether markets are functioning competitively, rather than on whether a bank or other financial firm is too big or too systematically significant to fail. Those concepts present political and regulatory issues that are better handled outside the realm of antitrust enforcement. The AMC made six recommendations relevant to the subcommittee's questions. One, there is no need, the, the, commission, the AMC uh, recommended that there is no need to revise the antitrust laws to apply different standards to different industries. Current law, including the horizontal merger guidelines applied by the antitrust division, is sufficiently flexible to address specific competitive circumstances in the banking or any other industry. Secondly, the AMC recommended that there is no need to revise Section 7 of the Clayton Act or the general framework used by the enforcement agencies and courts to assess mergers. The AMC found broad-based consensus that merger enforcement policy has become increasingly predictable, transparent, and analytically sound. This has resulted in a broad consensus in support of current enforcement policy, which has become the paradigm for enforcement around the world. Third, the AMC recommended that the Antitrust Division and the Federal Trade Commission should work to increase understanding of the basis for and the efficacy of U.S. merger enforcement policy. Notwithstanding the general consensus that exists in support of current policy, the empirical basis supporting assumptions about the effect of concentration, for example, is arguably limited. Although some studies in the banking industry suggest that there is a relationship between concentration and market power, there is substantially less sense about the level at which antitrust should bite. Focused study of this issue could improve the enforcement authority's ability effectively to enforce the antitrust laws. Extrapolating from this recommendation, it may be an appropriate time to review the empirical data and existing studies. Fourth, the AMC recommended that the antitrust division and the Federal Trade Commission in should increase the transparency of their decision making to enhance public understanding of the agency's merger enforcement policy. It may be a good time for the antitrust division to focus such efforts specifically on bank mergers. Fifth, the AMC recommended that Congress should not displace free market competition without extensive, careful analysis and compelling evidence 
that either competition cannot achieve important societal goals or that it th or trump and that trump consumer welfare or market failure requires the regulation of prices cost and entry in place of competition failing to enforce the antitrust laws where they would otherwise be enforced under current policy is unlikely to resolve the current economic price crisis but it could cause further harm to the economy in the future after markets have stabilized finally uh, the AMC recommend that it, even in industries subject to economic regulation, such as the banking industry, the antitrust agency should have full merger enforcement authority under the Clayton Act. The banking merger review regime closely uh, model uh, regime closely fits the model proposed by the AMC. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to answering any uh, questions. Thank you, Ms. Garb. Uh, <coughs> and next, uh, uh, and certainly not least. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cooper, would you grace us with your uh, presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This hearing is about one of the most important problems arising in the inadequately regulated financial sector that has plunged this nation into the worst economic crisis in three quarters of a century, the moral hazard of too big to fail. But the technical definition of moral hazard does not convey the full implications of this problem in the current financial crisis. So let me put a finer point in it. Capitalism without bankruptcy is like Catholicism without hell. It lacks a sufficiently strong motivational mechanism to ensure good behavior. The financial system never should have been allowed to become exposed to a plague of banks, shadow banks, and financial products that are too big to fail. And worse still, we have discovered that it's not only size that kills in the financial sector, but complexity and lack of transparency. Complex and opaque products and interconnections among firms that spread like a virus through the financial system and are nearly impossible to unwind also pose systemic risk. The bipartisan theory of market fundamentalism that got us into this current mess offered the proposition that all we needed to protect us from these problems was the market. But Alan Greenspan, the high priest of market fundamentalism, recently admitted that there's a flaw in his theory, quote, those of us who look to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself included, are in a state of shock disbelief. I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in their firms. If they can't protect the private interest, you can imagine the mess they make of the public interest. The flaw in market fundamentalism teaches us that competition alone is not enough to ensure the proper functioning of the financial system. It is clear that the only way to prevent the public from being exposed to the moral hazard of too big or too complicated to fail is to regulate financial institutions and products in a manner that imposes effective discipline on their behavior. And regulation must also address the other problems that afflict this inadequately regulated financial sector including asymmetric information, agency, conflicts of interest, perverse incentives, and unfairness. All of these are well beyond the reach of the antitrust laws. Effective prudential regulation should establish the framework within which competition works. When the New Deal created the institutions of prudential regulation to repair the financial sector after the crash that followed the Roaring Twenties, it did not repeal the antitrust laws. It layered prudential regulation atop the antitrust laws. The result was a most remarkable half century, the only half century that was free of a major domestic financial crisis in the history of the republic. There is much to do to restore effective regulation, but also much to restore effective antitrust oversight. Let me suggest four critical steps that would have helped to reduce the size of this problem. Could never have solved it, but it might have helped to reduce it. First, federal authorities should take their own guidelines more seriously, challenging mergers more consistently in highly concentrated markets. The theory of the dynamic duopoly has proven to be just as wrong-headed as market fundamentalism. Second, antitrust authorities must return to the fundamentals of head-to-head -head competition as the found foundation of antitrust action. Intermodal and potential competition have simply proved ineffective in disciplining market power. Head-to-head -head competition is what we need. Third, 
and i trust has given far too much deference to efficiency at the expense of competition the assumption that private actors will be perceptive and well intentioned in their pursuit of efficiency and share efficiency gains with consumers even where competition is feeble never made any sense and in light of the collapse of market fundamentalism it must no longer be replied upon private actors have proven that they are at least as likely to be my myopic misinformed and maleficent fourth the digital economy of the twenty first century is made up of platforms in which layers of complementary products and services sit atop one another and they are closely interconnected frequently through technology this renders the threat of vertical leverage much greater than was in the, ca the, the case in the physical markets of the nineteenth and twentieth century tying anti-competitive bundling and exclusionary conduct take on much greater significance the need for reform does not demand the radical new experiment rather it demands a return to the traditional values institutions and practices of progressive capitalism that served us well in the half century after the new deal the market fundamentalism of the past thirty years was the radical experiment and it, is, it has failed miserably it's time for us to abandon the market fundamentalist view that sees regulation and antitrust as the ex post cleanup after the occasional market pow power instead viewing uh, antitrust and regulation as the ex ante prophylaxis to prevent market failure thank you thank you dr cooper um, i appreciate uh, and i'm sure we all do uh, the testimony of these uh, of you all on this panel uh, without objection uh, members as well as uh, witnesses will have uh, five legislative days within which to submit any additional written uh, questions and responses. Um, without objection, the record will remain um, open for these five legislative days for uh, submission of any additional uh, materials. And again, I want to thank everyone uh, for your patience. And uh, uh, it's now time for questions. I will uh, yield to myself uh, five minutes for that purpose. And we will be uh, enforcing the five minute rule uh, uh, among the uh, congressional uh, representatives as well, though we may uh, go into a second uh, round of questions. Um, looking back over how some of these uh, financial institutions became so big and how the federal government responded to their uh, near failures, uh, what are the key lessons that uh, Congress should learn from this uh, economic crisis that we find ourselves in? Uh, and I'd like for each of you to an answer uh, that question, starting uh, with Mr. Four. Well, if we might focus on antitrust, the question, <clears throat> I think we've all pretty much agreed that um, uh, antitrust's actual responsibility for the kinds of conglomerate problems we see now uh, is not a failure of <clears throat> enforcement so much as the absence of authority to actually deal with a conglomerate merger. Uh, our merger policy is if there is a direct horizontal overlap, then we eliminate the overlap if it's anti-competitive, and we allow the merger to occur. So to the extent that we're worried about creating very large and complicated organizations whose uh, effects of an eventual failure need to be predicted far down the road, a very difficult prediction, we just don't have a mechanism for uh, dealing with that. Uh, there are other antitrust issues that might go in here uh, that are, are concentration issues in themselves. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there. Um, on the other hand, uh, had we been taking more concern about high levels of concentration, uh, it's possible that some of the very large institutions uh, we're dealing with over time might not have gotten to be this large. Uh, 
And in that regard, uh, one other area I would mention is uh, lemming, the lemming effect. A lot of times we have a merger that we know is going to kick off a series of additional mergers. And yet, we, we don't have a good mechanism for stopping that in its tracks. Uh, the agencies typically say we will look at one merger at a time. I'll give you an example. Right now, you've got Pfizer uh, and Wyeth, and at the same time, you've got Shearing and Merck, and you've got discussion of at least two, maybe three other mergers that will highly concentrate the pharmaceutical industry virtually overnight if they all go through. I think we need to be able to look at these uh, together. Uh, who knows whether we're going to create letting these go through one at a time, each one with a couple of uh, overlaps that get laid off, but, but the companies keep getting bigger and bigger and fewer and fewer, whether we might be creating a, a, a risk, a systemic risk right there in that industry. Yeah, Mr. Ford, thank you uh, for your response. And uh, don't forget about the Ticketmaster uh, Live Nation uh, uh, situation as well. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Yes. Um, you know, I'll give you a good example. Um, in the year 2000, there was a hearing held in this building by Congressman Baker on uh, City Corp buying the associates. Uh, quite a bit of discussion was held then about the predatory nature of the whole City Corp operation, which later they pled guilty to that. Uh, as you are well aware of, they paid a $200 million fine to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, City Corp was built on that basis. Uh, and what we have today, and I know many of my, my colleagues here say, well, we've got good competition. I would like anybody to explain to me how you compete with somebody who has the full faith and credit United States government. Uh, so far, Citicorp has received guarantees on their loans of $380 billion. They have a $10 billion guarantee by the FDIC. And, I mean, they, they are too big to fail. It's a perfect example. There are a number of other of the large eight that testified before the House Banking Committee that all have the guarantees of the United States government makes it very difficult to compete against. And I mean, they've already got to a size to where they're too big to fail. And Congress needs to take immediate action to do something about this, either that or we continue to pump trillions of dollars into these institutions that are uh, to a point that they, they're not competitive, don't have to be competitive. And I would use as another example AIG, who just told the President, good luck, we're doing what we want with our bonuses. Yeah, what, action, uh, <coughs> what actions do you think would be uh, appropriate uh, for Congress to make at this particular time? Well, you know, when, when Congress sits down and they look at the fact that the eight largest financial institutions in America now control 66 percent of the assets in this country, uh, I, I think that is an anti-competitive monopoly type situation. It needs to be looked at very closely by this committee. And I think that uh, no one would disagree when you have that much concentration in a marketplace, they have some real questions about competitiveness. I understand they say, well, in every market it, it, it's competitive, but the fact of the matter is these people control the financial system of America, and it is something that needs to be looked at very carefully. And all these mergers were done with don't worry, we've got control of it. I've been told that so many times, you know, it's unbelievable. And look at where it's led us at the end of the degree. We're bailing out the, the largest financial institutions in America. Thank you, sir. And it looks like my time has expired. So I will uh, now turn it over uh, to uh, the ranking member, Howard Cole, for questions. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to have you all with us today, my panel. Uh, Mr. Askew, the Financial Services Roundtable is calling for a streamlined financial regulator, including a national insurance regulator. The insurance industry's antitrust exemption, McCarran Ferguson, as we all know, is tied to the state regulation of insurance. Has Roundtable taken a position on McCarran Ferguson repeal? Uh, Congressman. We agree with the, with the advent of a national insurance regulator that we, that we talk about. We would agree with uh, then the, anti, uh, the antitrust laws applying to the national insurance. Uh, so you would not be in favor of, of repealing McCarran-Ferguson, or would you? 
I'm, I'm, we would agree with the, I, I guess we'd, I don't want to misanswer your question. Okay, well, I'll. We, I, will, I will get you a written answer. Okay. And follow I, up on how, the, I, I'm, I don't want to misstate the opinion of the round table. And I can appreciate that. And, and for the record, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've always been comfortable with state regulation for what that's worth, but I'll be glad to, to hear from you. Let me ask you this, Mr. Askew. What is Roundtable's position towards Graham Leach Bliley and Regal Neal, and do you all think those laws have pretty much accomplished what they were set out to do? Congressman, we certainly feel that those laws have done what they were set out to do, and we feel comfortable with how they are operating. Ms. Garza, what is the process for antitrust review for mergers utilizing TARP funds, A? And B, is it different than the traditional Hart, Scott, Rodino filing process? Is, is this consistent with the transparency that the Antitrust Modernization Commission recommended? Again, I'll throw three balls at you simultaneously. Uh, the the uh, fact that the uh, institution may have been the recipient of TARP funds really doesn't affect the process for review of the transaction. Uh, antitrust review of, of um, uh, bank mergers is governed by a set of statutes. Um, uh, it's the if um, it's a little complicated the extent to which Hart Scott Rodino applies. But when there is a bank consolidation that is reviewed by the federal banking agencies. So the, agent, the, Fed, the Justice Department does receive uh, information at the same time that the banking agencies do relevant to the transaction. And there's a 30-day period and it's comparable to the HSR, Hart Scott Rodino period, in which they uh, look at the transaction and uh, report to the, to the banking authorities. The way that it has worked, in my, in my understanding, is that the, the um, Justice Department and Antitrust Division has had the opportunity to uh, look at each of the transactions that have occurred where one of the parties was the recipient of TARP funds. That, so it didn't affect um, uh, the review of it. Now, it is the case that uh, some of those transactions were reviewed on an extremely expedited basis because of the exigencies of the circumstances, not because of TARP funds, but because of the economic uh, situation of one of the parties. In those cases, uh, my understanding is that the antitrust division was able to conduct the review that it needed to conduct. In the PNC National uh, City Corporation uh, transaction, for example, the agency did look at, look at the transaction, six or seven weeks, I think, is what we took to review it, and did require divestitures, which were agreed to by the parties and incorporated in the order of the uh, Federal Reserve Board. Uh, thank you. I think I have time for one more quick question. Mr. Cloutier, in, in your testimony, you indicate that the four largest financial institutions control 40 percent of the nation's deposits. Regal Neal limits bank holding companies to a maximum of 10 percent of deposits. Would you favor lower that, lowering that percentage? Absolutely, sir. And of course, before this crisis started, um, Ken Lewis at Bank America were pushing very hard to have that level raised. So. Absolutely, we prefer lowering it and be very careful because there are some banks that would like to raise that limit. And where would you like to lower it, Mr. Clark? I think 5% would be a good place to start to lower it to that level uh, and make sure that, you know, the 20 top banks in America couldn't control more than 100% of the deposits. I want to beat the illumination of that red light so the chairman won't come after me with, a, with, his, bug, with his buggy whip. But Mr. ask you if you'll get back on my question, I'd appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Koval. Um, next, we will hear from uh, our esteemed uh, chairman of the full committee, uh, Chairman Conyers. going here. Unanimous consent to uh, put my uh, statement in the record at this time. Without objection, and I was wondering why I saw some of my uh, uh, brethren from the aisle uh, right here at your, uh, at your spot. And uh, 
I don't get any uh, laughs on that. But what I meant was, <laughs> y'all know what I meant. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Chairman. This is a, an important hearing. And I, I really appreciate the selection of the witnesses. Talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Cooper, of course, has made the statement of, of which yeah. I'd like to invite your reactions to. Yeah. And I'm sure heartened by uh, Howard Coble's uh, review of uh, whether McCarran Ferguson and uh, where Hart Scott Rodino come in. But look at AIG. For example, uh, $178 million in bonuses, 73 people got more than a million dollars, some of them not even citizens. Uh, and they explained to us, well, it's uh, contractual members of Congress. Uh, we contracted to do that, and you don't expect us to go back on our word, do you? Uh, AIG, nine mergers since 1960, nine big ones, and uh, 5,400 mergers just between 1990 and 2005 alone. From Reagan on, uh, mergers have been growing and growing, but it was only, I think, under perhaps the Bush administration that they really got uh, into what we call mega mergers. 74 mergers in which each merger partner had more than $10 billion in assets. So I am not comfortable knowing to think that the the rules are working okay and uh, and that merger is are all right i think there's a connection uh, when greenspan can come clean i don't think it's hard for any of us uh, not to realize that we've got to do something about it um, i think uh, mergers, I've, I've never been comfortable about all the mergers that were going on all the time. Uh, one administration after the other, including the Democratic administrations. And so I, I would like to uh, get your reactions on that, uh, starting with Dr. Cooper and then uh, Ms. Garza. Well, um, it's difficult to see how the antitrust laws will solve the underlying problem of too big to fail. I do believe that that problem needs to be solved in prudential regulation. And I'll give you two examples. And, it, and what will happen, however, is that effective prudential regulation will make the mergers go away. Because essentially what we have to do is make, though any financial entity has to have the capital and pay the insurance so that its failure will not need recourse to the Treasury. And so what we need is dramatically escalating capital requirements uh, as you get bigger and bigger. And of course, the bankers will tell you, if you require me to have more and more capital, I can't leverage as much, and so I won't be able to do as many deals. Well, then that's exactly what we want, is we want them not to do as many deals. Second of all, if you dramatically increase the insurance premiums, and the capital requirements, should they fail, the insurance fund would have the resources and the capital would be available to resolve these institutions. Essentially what we've been told is that it is impossible to resolve AIG um, without pulling down other institutions. But if AIG had a very high capital requirement, they would have the assets available to resolve their own mess. If they had been required to pay heavy insurance premiums, those resources would be available to the resolution agency to resolve the mess without the recourse to the Treasury. So I believe that if we intend to be serious about preventing too big to fi fail, 
we will do so in a manner through potential regulation which will also solve your merger concern and i can think I that's ask the way for to a little additional time mr chairman General, and before i go to miss garza could i uh, ask for mr fors uh, feelings about this part of our hearing well sir um i i i agree that the um the, the problem for this hearing, the too-big-to-fail problem, is something beyond what antitrust was really able to do with. Now, the seller key Fowler Act came out of this committee. It said that we were going to deal with mergers that concentrate the economy in their incipiency. As the Chicago School became dominant in the setting of antitrust policy, uh, with uh, microeconomic analysis at the core. The burden shifted. <clears throat> the burden that I think Congress wanted back in the 50s was that we would really be worried about mergers and the tendencies they have toward concentration. And we moved away from that, and in a way we reversed our, our presumptions. The presumption today is that mergers are generally and mostly beneficial because they're efficient. And only a few represent problems. What I would say is the, the more we know about these things, the more worried we should be that at least very large mergers at the top of the scale, we should be reversing the burden. And instead of assuming that they're good and forcing the government to prove that they're bad, we should make the opposite assumption. And if we could work with that only for the very largest and most concentrating types of mergers, I think we might get back toward what Congress originally uh, was after. Ms. Garza. Uh, now, obviously, we have a lot of reason to be concerned about the, the situation we find ourselves in today, but I think that antitrust has very little role to play, have played in, in the reasons we are where we are. Um, uh, it's not so much that the uh, entities that are um, uh, being bailed out are large, it's, it's what they've done. Um, the, the too big to fail, this is, I think there's a relative consensus here, is really not an antitrust concept. Um, size is certainly relevant to the antitrust analysis of a merger in the sense that it's a starting point. Size in terms of market share is certainly a starting point in the antitrust analysis, but it's only that. Antitrust analysis today has evolved far beyond a knee-jerk reaction to a big as bad philosophy and is now rests on a very sophisticated assessment of the likelihood that a merger will result in uh, the acquisition or growth of market power uh, based on solid economic principles. Um, and it would be, I think, a mistake to move backward from that. I don't know how you would incorporate a standard or apply a standard that said simply size is a problem. Um, having said that, I think, it, it, you know, and we looked at this, as you know, at the AMC, we spent three years looking in part at the very question of whether uh, current merger enforcement po policy was properly calibrated, whether we were um, not stopping mergers that we should have stopped or stopping mergers that we shouldn't have stopped. And the general consensus was that merger uh, enforcement policy had evolved to about the right place, where we were uh, carefully considering um, the effects of, uh, of a merger on market power, on consumer welfare, but also allowing entities to engage in transactions that either, you know, were not anti-competitive or that um, uh, uh, benefited the economy through efficiencies. That balance, I think, is, is, is the correct way to go. Um, now, in the, in the banking area, like, as I said in my, in my written statement, it may be appropriate at this time to shed some light on this, to, to look at the number of studies that have been conducted and to, and to consider whether or not increased consolidation in the banking industry has resulted in uh, an effect of um, higher amounts being paid for loans, lower amounts being paid for deposits, other competitive effects. It would be worthwhile to look and see whether the vestitures that have been ordered in past transactions have been effective in what they uh, sought to accomplish. It would be worthwhile, I think, to look at what the effects are on um, the competitive dynamics of a marketplace when you have government intervention. 
uh, either you know government owning uh, partials, uh, taking partial stake in companies and and subsidizing the operations of companies. It would be useful to take a look at whether or not national concentration has affected the competitiveness of the interbank money markets. All those things I think I think to look at. But uh, before the, the uh, before Congress does anything, I've suggested it consider asking the antitrust division and the banking agencies to look at the data, so that when you do act, you're acting on a full sense of what's actually what the actual facts are. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are joined by uh, our colleague from Texas, Houston. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Honorable uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, welcome. Uh, Congresswoman, and now we will uh, go to uh, Mr. Shavitz. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Five minutes. I, I appreciate it. Mr. Cloutier, um, in your, has the TARP process uh, been sufficiently transparent from your perspective and that of the independent community bankers of America? Uh, you know, we, uh, we don't have enough information yet on the total TARP program uh, to know if it's totally transparent or not. Of course, uh, I have to tell you very honestly, Mr. Congressman, we wake up every morning under some new rules, so they continue to change. And, you know, so, uh, you know, is it top one, top two? So it continues to change. And the bailouts, as we've seen with AIG, continue to change. Um, and, and, and Ms. Garza, I question for you. Um, from a purely procedural view, view uh, what steps should the Obama administration take, if any, to ensure the transparency of the merger review process in the context of the TARP fund? Uh, you know, the, the Antitrust Modernization Commission made the recommendation, in fact, that the agencies should focus on transparency, and the agencies have taken steps toward that with their merger guidelines, uh, speeches, um, testimony, reports. Uh, I actually have said in my written statement, I think that it may be appropriate to focus some of those efforts more specifically on the banking mergers. It's important for the uh, public to have confidence in what the antitrust agencies are doing, and it would help uh, a confidence in obviously what the government's doing, but also that the antitrust agencies are doing their job. So I think it would help with that if, um, if the new administration would focus on explaining, uh, not only to Congress, but to the public, how it is that they're conducting their investigations in these, uh, with respect to these bank consolidations that involve TARP funds, where that where enforcement action is taken, why it's not being taken. Uh, I have no particular reason to believe that the agency is won't do, uh, act appropriately, but I do think it's useful for them to explain the standards they're applying and, and explain the decision making. So I think that would be good. The other thing I've suggested is that it may be appropriate for the agency to do uh, similar to what it did recently in the telecom industry, which is to uh, have a symposium and report on um, the state of competition in the financial industry and to clarify what its um, standards are going forward. I noticed that the incoming head of the antitrust division did indicate she had a desire to revisit how bank mergers were, uh, were being looked at. Um, hopefully that, that revisiting will lead to a, pol a transparent policy of, um, of discovery in this area, discovery of with respect to the data that exists on where we are now and then on discussion about what should be done going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Farr, you uh, seem to be in agreement with uh, Ms. Garza and Mr. Askew that antitrust analysis is not to blame for the current crisis. Rather, it is a problem of the competition policy more broadly defined. Um, if this is not a problem of antitrust, why do you advocate for the creation of a new, of a new deputy position within antitrust? Um, the the uh, there are two issues here. Competition policy really is anything that uh, the government does that affects competition. That includes your sectoral regulation. Uh, antitrust is just limited to your three laws: the uh, Clayton Sherman and FTC Act, primarily. Mm -hmm. So um, the antitrust division has always had an advocacy function where it goes before other agencies and it explains what the competition implications of a given regulation or, or even a legislative proposal would be. And that's a very proper and important function of the antitrust division. Now, what I'm saying is this emergency recession situation where we are rapidly restructuring the economy and having huge effects on competition is so important that there should be one person designated 
to report to the Assistant Attorney General, but to have the backing of Congress to sit there in all the meetings, the various planning meetings, to be able to talk with the Secretary of the Treasury, with the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, and with others uh, in the White House who are doing the planning, and to make sure that the voice for competition is heard. Because we're going to be making some very tough decisions with long-term consequences, and in some cases it'll be necessary to make decisions that are anti-competitive. But let's keep those to the minimum when they are absolutely required. And the other thing is we got to deal with this in the future. We shouldn't think that these decisions now are necessarily permanent. We've got to come back to all of this after the crisis is over and we've resolved the crisis and then figure out where we want to be. And that's going to take a whole new inventory of where we are. And it's going to take building a consensus about where we want to go. And I think it's too soon to do that because we don't know how far down we're going. We don't know where we're going to be at the bottom. Thank, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, next, we'll have questions from uh, Congresswoman uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for this hearing. You, uh, as well as the ranking member, Ms. Coble from North Carolina, and uh, the certainly the full committee chair uh, and the ranking member. Um, I'm going to, I guess, be the skunk of the party and uh, indicate uh, that one, um, I believe the Judiciary Committee has a amazingly uh, instrumental and intricately um, uh, important role, if you will, on this whole question of reordering our markets. Not to suggest that everyone engaged should uh, be held criminally liable uh, in the markets, no. But I think uh, the partnership of regulation and enforcement is key. And not so much enforcement for those of you who uh, are certainly proponents of the free market that we would kill the free market. Uh, but I'm not c uh, totally convinced uh, that the antitrust laws don't have a, an important role uh, that can be utilized. And, and let me just um, indicate uh, that uh, one of the issues of uh, antitrust laws is monopolization. And I would imagine that um, I would uh, be refuted, if you will, on the issue of monopolization of the banking industry by the fact that they carry different names. And you're absolutely right. So you're, you can't say that um, uh, for Citigroup is a monopoly because there are counterparts, there are their equals are in the business. But you can say that big banks create a monopoly. Um, and it may be that they are intrinsically part of the capitalistic system. But the name big banks or the entity big banks are a monopoly. Uh, and you can uh, point out to me what uh, little guy has risen to be a big guy in the last 50 years, short of um, the big guys buying them up. And you might say, well, the big guys have uh, now added, and so that little guy finally got in. But no, that little guy was eaten up. Uh, so I, I frankly believe that maybe we need to breathe life into the antitrust laws that begin to look at industries in a monopolistic or that they're monopolistic in a fashion in terms of how they uh, bar uh, growth from others who are competing against them. Some would say community banks, regional banks, and private banks are not competing. They are. Now, these banks have been very proud to say, for example, that it was not us, and, and, and they are still doing well. They didn't take the uh, marketplace. Uh, Ms. Coltier, you're familiar, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, you're familiar that you didn't uh, probably take the kinds of mortgages. Uh, you probably knew a lot of those who came into your bank that you gave mortgages to. Um, I don't want to suggest that uh, we don't want to spread the opportunity of home ownership. I was certainly part of that, but I certainly wasn't part of uh, uh, the predatory type form, the subprime, you know, that people who could afford regular mortgages were getting subprime, just in a, a skewed marketplace. So let me um, raise some questions. AIG, for example, is a monopoly. How do we allow uh, one company to be the insurer of everything, making bread, uh, going across the street, making movies? Uh, every that that is monopolistic. Now that's insurance, uh, but it's a marketplace. It has a marketplace role. I frankly believe that uh, our laws have a responsibility, antitrust laws, to address that bigness that is injures the marketplace. Because what happens is 
AIG is so big and the regulatory process is so limited. So, Mr. Coltier, why, why don't you, um, since you seem to be the lone wolf uh, trying to argue for um, uh, this idea of having some involvement, uh, how do you, um, how would you uh, suggest uh, that Congress uh, be creative in its thinking on using antitrust laws that I frankly believe need to be updated? And I want to thank uh, Theodore Roosevelt for his, um, if you will, um, uh, wiseness because we've done well since. But what, how would you think we would intervene if we were to use antitrust laws? Well, as I, I mentioned a while ago, to answer the question, I think the first thing you do is you drop the limit on what, uh, what a large bank particularly can hold in assets. And then I think your question about AI. Do we kill the market that way? Uh, you know, you won't kill the market. I mean, I guarantee you in the state of Texas, if, if City Corp had to sell branches in the state of Texas, Don Adams would buy them all, and the ones he wouldn't buy, Don Powell would. <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, you're going to have very good competition. And, and, you know, I will tell you that, uh, you know, I would just point out that, that yesterday uh, President Obama and Secretary Geithner reached out to the community bankers. I happen to have the picture here of our current chairman who lives mm -hmm. in the state of Texas who made the presentation yesterday with the president about small business lending and getting back to the core of America in that type of lending. You know, often when these large CEOs buy these companies, Ms. Lee, it's amazing how much they pay themselves for doing that, so which, you th which is which is led to where we are today. The chairman would indulge me an additional minute uh, to raise my other question with Ms. Garza. Thank you, Mr. Coltier. I, 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 um, uh, you were talking about the limits. Ms. Garza, why don't you think modernized antitrust laws uh, could not be effective? And would you have keep an open mind to the extent that um, there may need to be some modernizing of our laws? I ask an additional, I ask unanimous consent for an additional minute, chairman. Without Thank objection. You. Thank you. Ms. Garza. All right. Well, the, my, just to be clear, my position isn't that the antitrust laws have no role to play. In mm. fact, my statement is very clear that I think they do uh, have Thank a role you for to correcting play. me. Maybe you can expand on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. And so, for example, uh, as I said, as, as while, there, while we clearly have an interest in uh, shoring up the stability of the markets today, I, what I have said is I think that we have to be, be also uh, careful about consolidation that, uh, to, that occurs today that may affect the competitiveness of the marketplace in the future. So I don't think that antitrust should be displaced. I think it has a role to play. Um, I all, but I, but uh, what I was that I also said is I don't think that you can lay the current um, crisis at the foot of antitrust enforcement. Um, the, the issues that have brought us to where the, the problems that have brought us to where we are today um, are much more complex and different than the size of the institutions. Um, and people here have, have mentioned what some of those problems are. Those are, and, and I mentioned them in my paper, those things have to be dealt with, um, but they're beyond the uh, scope of antitrust enforcement. So what I would suggest is that we, we don't put the antitrust laws on the shelf. We don't do what was mistakenly done at the time of the, of the depression and say, well, we can't afford the antitrust laws anymore. I think we can afford the antitrust laws. And I do believe that the antitrust laws, the way they're enforced today, are not incompatible with um, I I steps that need to be taken um, to try to shore up the stability of our financial yeah, markets. And I agree with you. Can we not consider, uh, rather than looking at the isolated name group, Citigroup and others, look at the bank, big banks banking industry in terms of modernizing our antitrust laws to try to penetrate what's what not cause them but to keep them from doing that again I, I, the the structure of the market is an important thing to look at and uh, I can't sit here today and say that I have studied the structure of the market or that I think it's monopolistic or, or oligopolistic what I what I do think is that um, this is something that would be appropriately tasked to the antitrust division to, to look at the antitrust division after all does have jurisdiction to review bank mergers. They do have a process that has been in place since 1995 uh, for looking at bank mergers that does tend to focus on effects in localized markets where lending is done and deposit taken is uh, deposits are taken. And I, th I think that that process um, has worked well, but to the extent there are questions about the effect of consolidation now, the effect of the interconnectedness, you know, whether that's happen having, uh, whether it's affecting prices that are paid, diversity, et cetera, all those things I think are legitimate to look at. Uh, but I, at this point, I can't say that I think that antitrust has failed. Um, only, uh, the only thing I can say is that it may be worth further investigation about how the markets are operating. 
Thank you. And, and I, I just agree with, um, it just say one thing, I agree with Bert for, I don't necessarily agree that there needs I, to be a new Deputy Assistant Attorney General appointed, but I do agree with him that the Antitrust Division and the Justice Department should be at the table um, when steps are taken to ensure that there is a voice um, speaking for about the competitive effects of various actions that are taken. I think that the Assistant Attorney General probably can fill that role and the Attorney General. Thank you. I'd, I'd like, uh, let me thank you. I'd, I'd like to make an inquiry of the chair as I thank, uh, thank him for his leadership on this issue. I think the door that um, uh, Ms. Garza has opened and the door that I started out on is uh, we're always playing around the edges of antitrust law, but we might need some creative updating. Um, I know that one suggestion has been um, a deputy uh, position and someone has disagreed, you've disagreed with it, but a, a creative updating on um, how we um, in essence, uh, restrain uh, some of the uh, bad acts that bigness created. Uh, you know, I still think there's a monopolistic scenario with all the big banks. They're in there together, and I don't think our antitrust laws may fit that. They usually fit a big entity like GM, but they don't fit the collective, and we may need to, to deal with that because we need to get our feet in the door on enforcement. That might help a lot of our, our citizens who are suffering right now, Mr. Chairman, and, and I look forward to working with you uh, on that on that issue on that approach thank you, you uh, congresswoman and uh, your your point is uh, well taken uh, we'll be uh, having further uh, discussions and hearings on uh, that very issue so thank you thank you and uh, time for uh, this hearing has um, now I'll, I'll say it's expired uh, and I'm sure that you all uh, are uh, uh, that makes you happy. Um, so uh, again, without uh, objection, members will have five legislative days to submit any additional written questions, which uh, we will forward to the witnesses and ask that you answer as properly, promptly as you can, and they will be made uh, a part of the record. Um, without objection, the record will remain open for five legislative days. Uh, for the submission of any uh, additional materials. And I, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for their time and uh, their patience. And um, this hearing of the Subcommittee on Courts and Competition Policy is adjourned. Good job, Mr. Chairman.